over at bangthebook.com. We are your one-stop shop for sports betting news and information. I've got previews up over there for both wild card games. Tonight's National League, tomorrow's American League. Once series prices get posted, I've got the two series previews written up for uh, Braves and Cardinals, then also Yankees and Twins. So those will go up over at the website here probably sometime later on today. College football power ratings posted, college football and NHL situational betting tips available over there. Recaps of the Super Contest and the Circa Million. We'll have golf from James Mazzola. NHL starts tomorrow, so we'll have Parker Michaels' daily article. Uh, We'll have a lot of great stuff going on this week over at bangthebook.com. Big UFC event this weekend. I'll preview that. NASCAR playoffs still going on as well, so make sure you check all that out. Also, we'll start today uh, with our video previews over at our Bang the Book YouTube channel, so you can check those out later on this afternoon and early this evening. And of course, as you know, this and every edition of Bang the Book Radio, presented by our friends over at DSI Sportsbook, BTB, and the number 200 is that promo code, 100% deposit match bonus for the sportsbook, 100% deposit match bonus for the live casino. At BetDSI, it's only a game until you bet it. Two guests on the program here today. We start things off with Brian Blessing, the host of Sportsbook Radio and Vegas Hockey Hotline. Brian, how's it going today, man? Hey, Adam. How you doing, buddy? Doing very well. Appreciate your time, as always. Thank you so much for joining me here on the program today. And uh, look, let's go ahead and start with the NFL, because I know I know that we want to spend some time on the NHL with that season getting underway. But hey, you know what? Except for the Jets and the 49ers, these teams have played 25% of the regular season games that they're going to play. What have you found out so far here through the first four weeks of the NFL season? Well, it's the year of a backup quarterback. I mean, and uh, the one thing I would say when we always talk about trying to get ahead of the number, um, you know, we talked about New Orleans when Breeze went down that based on where they reside, although the Panthers give them credit have been better and the, the Bucks with the win over the Rams, you're saying, you know, New Orleans tread water, go three and three till Breeze gets back and they probably still win the NFC South and they should really make the case could have won that game against the Rams. Then they go up and they beat Seattle. They beat the Cowboys with Bridgewater, and 16-1 to was the number on New Orleans to win the Super Bowl. Bottom line is, now they've got a tiebreaker on Dallas. Uh, you look down the road, I mean, New Orleans, uh, you know, Pittsburgh obviously fell off the map. You hear these massive injuries. But, but New Orleans is probably sitting there right now with, with the best shot to have home field advantage in, in the NFC. And they're 16-1, to or were 16-1. to I'm sure they came down after uh, this past week. Yeah, it's so interesting because, you know, like you said, I mean, you're going to get Drew Brees back, and, and not only that, you're going to get back, what, Brees is 39 years old, I think. You're going to get back a 39-year-old quarterback that, you know, hasn't had to expend a lot of energy early on in the season, and obviously you wonder if the injury will have any lingering effects, but that's an excellent point because, you know, that's something that I was kind of looking at here a little bit, too, is that, you know, some of these teams, I kind of looked at this uh, from an NBA futures standpoint, somebody like the Pacers with Victor Oladipo, getting him back at the midpoint of the season – that's 30 or 40 games that aren't on his legs. You know, you've got, now you're going to have, what, eight, ten games that aren't on Drew Brees' arm. So these are important things to look at from a futures market, to be sure. And, you know, obviously something to consider when we get to the NHL discussion, uh, not that you play futures early on, but you know, these guys that are hurt early in the year, they're going to be fresh coming back, and, and that can be a big advantage. And you know, I think that it applies the most to the Saints right now because some of the other sort of starting quarterbacks that are out either aren't coming back or weren't that good anyway, we know Breeze can play. Well, and the other thing I would say, you know, your backyard, uh, you know, the Browns were burning money and the hype and all this other stuff. Um, but last week, I, you know, I, I, I believe we may have talked about that game. Uh, I, I love the Browns against the Ravens for one reason. If they played us a game in week nine, you know, maybe it's a different animal. But if the Ravens won that game last week, I mean, for the most part, the division's over. The AFC North is, you know, long way to go. But the, the AFC North w- would have been really Baltimore in the catbird seat. The Cleveland's got to go cross country and play San Fran up the bye. And you look at their upcoming schedule. And, and literally, Cleveland had to look at that game. You know, yeah, it's week four. Some games are bigger than others. And that was a monster game. And now we got a, now we got a horse race in the AFC North. I don't know. You tell me. You pick a team in the AFC South. Who, when it's over, 
What's all said and done? Who do you like there? I, I guess I would say Indianapolis because I trust Frank Reich more than any other coach in the division. I think you can throw a blanket over him. I, 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 I'm with you. I, you know, Houston's hard to trust. Uh, Indy's got a lot of players, but the, the luck thing was bizarre. Um, the, the Jags are just too undisciplined. I think Tennessee's a pretty well-coached football team, and that's a nasty defense, and they got a running game. It's Mariota, who you can't trust. But I, I would say this to you. There are games in the early stages of the season that I think you look back on. Uh, and, and, again, that New Orleans-Dallas game. That New Orleans-Dallas game, when we get to January, you may look back on that, and that's the difference between New Orleans playing at home, playing Dallas at home. Um, I, I think this Buffalo-Tennessee game, I think this is a, this is a game, there's a monster game for what happens down the road uh, in terms of what a tiebreaker situation may look like. And you're going to see countless games like this. Uh, but, but some games are bigger than others. Yeah, most definitely. We'll talk about that game in a couple of minutes here, but I do want to talk about Thursday Night Football with you here first, Brian, because, you know, we talk about perception. We talk about how these teams are viewed coming into the season, and then once we get some data points, how we wind up viewing these teams. I don't think that anybody would have said Seattle would be a favorite in week five, short week be damned, against the Los Angeles Rams. But here we are with the Seahawks as a two-point favorite and a lot of questions about the Rams and Jared Goff in particular. Yeah, that, that was such a bizarre thing. Um, you know, Wade did Phillips defense, you know, he knows how to dial things up and make life miserable for people, and they just got shredded. And Goff threw for a gazillion yards, but he makes a lot of bad decisions during the game, and they just had this defined unwillingness to run the football, and I don't understand it. Um you know, and if it's not girly, so be it. I mean, they drafted a running back. I mean, they've got to run the football. You're not winning games when your quarterback's throwing for 500 yards. So it's a one-off. I don't think you go nuts. Uh, Seattle, it was a real workmanlike effort. You go into Arizona and, and you win the game. Russell Wilson's amazing. Uh, you know, on a weekly basis, man, he's got these guys in the game. And Pete Carroll just flat out knows what he's doing. Uh, you know, but – Week to week, Adam, I think this is a function of what we've talked about on this uh, podcast for a couple of years now. In the last two, three years, week to week, based on the last game, you see ridiculous fluctuations in a number. It's like, okay, I mean, I'm not saying you completely ignore what happened last week, but you'll see a game move two and a half points, three points, and change favorites based on the last game. Well, and as you look at this thing, too, I mean, last year, and I I realize the Rams went to the Super Bowl. I I understand that, and I understand that, as we talked about on yesterday's show, a lot of teams are now just planning to defend the Sean McVay scheme because so many teams around the NFL are running it. But Seattle here has covered four of five against the Rams. Last year's spreads, week five, Seahawks at home were a touchdown underdog. Seahawks on the road in week 10 were an eight-and-a-half-point underdog. And here they are, a two-point favorite against the Rams. And, again, I understand it. You know, Jared Goff maybe is regressing. He's very lucky to have some elite-level route runners. Otherwise, he would be a bottom, you know, bottom 10 quarterback in the NFL. He just has route runners that get open, and he can make enough throws to get them the football. Seattle, this is a team that's a little bit shy of talent, I think, on both sides of the ball. But they just get the job done. And Ross is a big part of it, like you said. You know, Pete Carroll's a big part of it. Uh, you know, they've had so much turnover on defense. They're not that bad of a unit back there. This is going to be a really interesting game because I think you're going to have a lot of pro Rams sentiment from, you know, the, the crowd of people that are like, well, you don't want to overreact here because the Rams are still a very good team and nobody really liked Seattle coming into the season. But in terms of current form, it's hard to argue with the Seahawks being a favorite here. I think this is a really challenging handicap compounded by the fact that it's a Thursday night game. Well, I think you just nailed it there at the end. Uh, I mean, if, if you think of this number, okay, there's the reaction to what happened last week. There's that you want to make the case that's the best home field advantage, uh, the 12th man up in Seattle. You know, what's that worth? Uh, is, is that a is that a three point, two and a half, three points? Is it the best home field advantage? Then, albeit it's not long travel, but it's still you know, these guys got to do the ice tub do their walkthroughs, hop on a plane and travel. Seattle doesn't. 
that's got to be worth something. So there's a myriad of factors that have made this number what it is. Well, yeah, and, and not only that, not just the short travel for Thursday night, but also the fact that this is the Rams' third game in 11 days because they played that Sunday night game on the road in Cleveland. So to go. Cleveland, back home, lose at home to Tampa Bay and look very bad in the process, and then play Seattle here on Thursday night. So the Rams are not in a very good spot here. And, and again, you have a team that's got some offensive issues here. I know they scored 40 points and threw for a million yards, but it's very clear that they're just not – all that efficient on offense this season. And as you mentioned, maybe finding a way to get Todd Gurley more involved uh, may be the way to go. And that's the funny thing too. You know, everybody hates the run first attitude that some of these teams have a lot of the modeling crowd, the quant crowd, the very vocal people out there hate when teams run the football on first down, hate when teams want to establish the run Seattle already does it. So maybe the under is the play here with the total now up to 50. It's funny, but I I actually would probably lean personally to the over uh, just because I think the Rams have tons of weapons and Seattle's going to fare well at home. I, You know, uh, the, the one thing is it's a division game and that familiarity aspect of it. But man alive, I mean, you know, Pete Carroll, they, they got film on what Tampa Bay just did to them. I mean, I, I don't, you, you know, I don't know if you could put a Band-Aid on a head wound that fast. That's a good point. And also, you've got road golf here. So, I wonder what that narrative looks like, especially after everybody watched that game against the Browns. And I know the Rams came away with the win and the cover, but road golf didn't look very good. So, we'll see how road golf fares here against the 12th man up in Seattle. We move way you know, down the, the card. Thing, and, the thing, go ahead. Buddy, the other thing, real quick, real quick. The other thing is, Todd Gurley, I, I don't, you know, it's hard to say eyeball-wise, well, he doesn't look like the same guy. I just don't think they're using him. Uh, and and they're, they're, I think, trying to save him big picture. Um, but at some point, um, I think their fortunes, you better get Gurley right. And, and, and we got to get a read on whether this guy is, a, even a shadow of what he was last year because they're just not using him. No, they're not. And, and, you know, not just golf with the arm talent and, you know, the fact that he's just, you know, not making all the throws this year. A lot of people have severely questioned his ability to read a defense and maybe you have to just call more designed runs just so this guy doesn't have to make those line calls and, you know, be audible or whatever else, because, you know, one of the things that they changed a few years ago in the NFL is that, the communication between the sideline and the quarterback is shut off with 15 seconds left on the play clock. So McVay can't sit there and tell Goff every little thing to do. Goff's got to figure some of this out for himself. And that's been one of the big knocks on him. So you know, maybe he's supposed to be changing to a few more run plays at the line. He's just not doing it. Maybe you've got to start calling more of those run plays just to, if nothing else, take some of the pressure off the guy because he's in a very precarious spot right now where he could just outright collapse with all that pressure that's on him. And it's not like the Rams have great quarterback depth either. No. And, you know, I think that the other thing you should take into account is, yeah, he's going for 500 yards. Sometimes they score quick, but he's also, you know, causing turnovers. And, you know, you got the best defensive player in the league. But if he's out there on the field all the time, Aaron Donald's, you know, he's just another guy. They're, they're sucking wind out there. So, so running the ball and moving the chains, uh, you know, that's important. Well, as we look at the rest of the NFL card here for week five, if, if you've got things you need to take care of, the four o'clock hour is probably not a bad idea for the East Coasters. One o'clock hour, of course, for the West Coasters out there. There are two games in the four o'clock window. Denver and the Chargers probably going to be a dud. Green Bay and Dallas quite possibly the best game of the week. So, Maybe you do want to hang out and get stuff done for that, but a lot of games here in this 1 o'clock window, including game 469, 470, Buffalo on the road at Tennessee. You know where I have to start this discussion here, Brian. What is the mindset of the Buffalo Bills coming off of that loss to the Patriots? I would like to think they're feeling like I am, and that's not bad. They played their lungs out. That defense – is spectacular. You know what? The Patriots' defense is spectacular. Josh Allen did not play well. 
Um, but that was what that game was all about. And, you know, they have throttled Brady now four games in a row. But the Patriots always win the game. And Brady made an incredible throw to James White right out of the gate, and, and Milano, the linebacker, was right on him. And he put his hands in to his chest where his hands were, and it was like 80% the ball would hit his hand. And White makes this incredible catch, like the two-yard line, they score a touchdown. Subsequent possession, blocked punt for a touchdown. That was it. That was it for the Patriots. They could not get a first down. Now, the Bills' defense is the real McCoy. So the big story in this game is going to be, oh, can Allen play or can he? The, the one thing, you know, I don't think a lot of people, to be honest with you, uh, the Bills are buried, right? I've been mean, probably not, not a lot of people pay attention to the Bills. Matt Barkley can play. He came into that Patriots game, and he was actually faring better with Allen. The problem was, agree with it or disagree with it, uh, McDermott, they had a fourth and goal down six and, and went for it with a lot of time left, instead of kicking the field goal, that would have made the last drive completely different. The Bills had to drive down and get a touchdown. Had they only needed a field goal, you know, Barkley's not stre- trying to stretch the field. He's just trying to move down and kick a field goal. I think Bar- Barkley came off the street last year and put 41 up on the Jets, and he was spectacular in preseason. So I, I, I wouldn't, it's going to be a different animal now. I mean, this guy's a stationary quarterback. The big news is I think Singletary comes back, and that's a big edge. A big help for Buffalo. But I would tell you this is – this should be a back alley brawl. I mean, the total reflects that. I think you got two really good defenses here. And I, it, it's not for the – this one's not for the faint of heart. And if you like old-style football, that, that Bills-Patriots game, 16-10, you, you know, if you look at oh, that was a yawner. That was a great football game. These guys were playing with passion, flying around, making hits interceptions, sacks. It, it was a great football game. Well, pretty good timing for the Bills to have their bye next week because they're probably going to need it coming off of that Patriots game and then here with this Tennessee game this week. Tennessee is so perplexing to me. You know, I mean, they beat the Browns by three. Baker was awful. They had the three interceptions. They had, you know, some short fields they took advantage of. A couple of real big plays on offense. The Titans were better than the Browns in that game, but they certainly weren't as good as that final score would suggest. Lose at home to the Colts, lose and look really bad on a short week at Jacksonville, and then come back and beat the Falcons by two touchdowns on the road. Tennessee, it's four weeks into the season, and I don't know what to expect from them week in and week out. That's so fair, and and I think it starts with Mariota. It's one week to the next. I forget the game. Um, Was it the Thursday night game, possibly? Uh, yeah, I got sacked nine times. Yeah, but he's throwing like a seven yard out, and he almost killed a kid in the stands. Like, you know, <laughs> he was horrible. He was horrible, and then he was better in the second half. But then, then you have games where he makes great plays with his feet, and I, I think this is real simple. Uh, I mean, I, I just I can't see Mariota doing a lot of damage against this Bills defense. Uh, their safeties are so good. It, it they you know they. They just do not let people beat them down the field. And, uh, you know, it's real simple. It's Der- Derrick Henry. I think Derrick – I'd, I'd, I'd say Derrick Henry over under – for them to win this game, give Derrick Henry 120 yards. Right? I mean, I, they, they just got to they got to stick with the running game against the Bills. Mariota will not beat them down the field, I don't think. So you like Buffalo getting a three? If you can find a three out there at reasonable juice? There are better games out there, bud. I mean, I, like the, the Bills game, I, I, I leaned to the Bills against the Patriots. I mean, I, I really thought, I said at a seminar in the summer, I thought they could beat them in that week. And sure enough, I mean, it was there for the taking. But you got to tip your hat to the Patriots defense. You know, we, we, we go Brady this, Brady that. You know, so, you know, in midweek, I said, man, yeah, you know, it's still the Patriots. And I, I, I switched, and I thought the under was the way to go. So I played the under in that game. This is a really low total, but I, I honest to God, I, I think the field goal kickers are going to be real busy in this game. All right, so we transition to the NHL for a few minutes here. Opening night on Wednesday, four games on the docket. The Blues will raise a banner against the Capitals, who know what that banner raising ceremony is like because they did it this time last year. San Jose and Vegas, they played a, 
real dogfight of a preseason game on Sunday. They play Wednesday night, and then they also play Friday night in San Jose. Two of their four meetings in the regular season coming here in the first three days, which I don't really get the scheduling plan there. But as far as general NHL betting tips here, Brian, what are some things you would share with the listeners? What are some things they should look for? Well, the beauty of the NHL season is, you know, finding the opportunities with backup goalies, teams playing three games in four nights. Uh, the dad's trip, we'll be watching that. has always been a massive moneymaker. Another one, and a lot of times it's hard to find out, but is find out when there are ceremony games. And you know, basically, I always, you know, they, they come out, they warm up, both teams, and then the visitors, or the home team goes out to the ceremony. Visiting team stays in the locker room, chewing on nails. They come out and jump on the home team. It happens 80% of the time. And the Super Bowl champ raises a banner and for whatever reason, and then they kill people. In football, uh, in the opener, uh, they kill people. And they don't do the big delay. The way they do the ceremonies in football, they don't, they, they don't really break the routine of the players. But, I mean, listen, uh, I've got the one I, I, there are a bunch of them, but when the Kings won the cup, you know, they, they come out and the banner and the whole nine yards and they're all hooting and hollering and standing around. The Blackhawks came out of the locker room were up three, nothing before they even sat down. Um, I, I like Washington. I like Washington in, in, in this first game. And I would say this, I honest to God, and I could be dead wrong. And I, I, I'm thrilled for the blues, what they did last year. And that was a remarkable story. But the Stanley Cup hangover is a real thing. Some guys got some money. Uh, you know, remember how bad they were, and then they they flipped the switch and just didn't look back. Uh, you know, interim coach, the whole nine yards. Momentum's a funny thing. I think I think the Blues, I think it's a good team. It's, just, you know, it's a real good team. But I think, I think they're hard-pressed in the West just to make the playoffs. I mean that. Well, as we look at Wednesday night's odds here, and I, I just want to touch on this sort of as more of a general thing, Toronto is about a minus 275, minus 280 favorite against Ottawa, who's probably going to be the worst team in the NHL this year. Blues in the 135, 140, 145 range against Washington. Edmonton, about a dollar twenty-five favorite at home against Vancouver. Vegas, that line's coming down, but it's minus 165 to minus 175 out there. We still see some big favorite prices early on in the NHL. Do you feel like these good teams hit the ground running? You know, do these bad teams sort of think, hey, it's early. We still have a shot. You know, do you tend to look more dogs early on, more favorites early on? Do you just sort of take it on a game-by-game basis? Yeah, I, you know, I, I still, it's a new season, and we talked about it all summer, and we know who these guys are. But, you know, find the cohesion, chemistry, whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, how are goalies playing. I think you want to see what's shaking out of the gate um, in a new season. Uh, I will tell you, though, I would envision Vegas coming out of the gate and, I mean, Stormtrooper stuff early. I mean, this was a team with a lot of pent-up frustration over the course of the summer. And to your point, I think it was sheer brilliance that the NHL starts the season with a home-and-home with these two teams. And it was sheer stupidity to have them play a preseason game right before that. I mean, what, what, what did you think was going to happen? And then I will say it was sheer stupidity. I, it's like Vegas is juggling grenades, you know, in a 40-mile-an-hour wind, playing flurry in that game. I, they do this stuff with this guy all the time. It's like, don't play him so much and don't put him in situations. Nothing happened, but he got hit a couple of times. You know, that, that game had nothing but powder keg written all over it. I think Vegas takes them to the woodshed on Wednesday night. Then, so I think it's the puck line in, in that one. And by the way, it's not a dollar seventy-five here. Let me tell you. <laughs> if, if you <laughs> no, I'm sure it's, it's not a dollar seventy-five here. Um, but I would say puck line on Vegas in the first game, and then San Jose going home their home opener, and some angst is built up. And I think that game will be kind of a track meet game. I, I, I mean, it's early. I mean, my plan of attack is puck line Vegas game one. Game two's over. All right, so just some other things to talk about here just re- with regards to the NHL. Seven new head coaches here this year, and, and by new head coaches, I mean with different teams. Ottawa's D.J. Smith, the only guy who's never coached in an NHL game, 
uh, Ralph Kruger, of course, coming over from the international ranks to be the Buffalo bench boss. But Joel Quenville, Elaine Vino, Todd McClellan, Dave Tippett, very, very experienced head coaches here in new places. Quenville with the Florida Panthers, Vino with the Philadelphia Flyers. McClellan goes to the L.A. Kings, which is pretty interesting since he had all that success with the San Jose Sharks. Dave Tippett now with the Edmonton Oilers. Dallas Eakins, the other new head coach with the Anaheim Ducks. What about new head coaches early on in the year? Do you feel like it takes them some time? Sure. Players take them time to know what the coach really wants from them. Because in preseason, it's such a hodgepodge of guys. You know, I mean, now the team's going to play together. The team, maybe, you know, three-quarters of the team played a game. You know, I mean, so again, this rhythm and, you, you know, getting chemistry with line mates and deep pairings. Uh, some guys are veterans. They know how to do it. Uh, it's going to take some time. One thing I would tell you about the Kings, uh, you know, they looked – they were atrocious last year. And they looked old and tired. And in the preseason, I'll tell you what, I saw a couple of Kings games. The one thing McClellan's got going here, he's still – he's got the veteran older guys. They got some kids that can fly. I mean, the, the watch – I don't think they're going to be great. But I don't think the Kings are going to be anywhere near as bad as people think because they, they play with speed. They, they got a lot of young kids ready to rock and roll. Well, and, and I mean, that was the thing that Edmonton was hoping to get out of McClellan because McClellan took a lot of young forwards in San Jose, really molded them into a very, very strong team. Edmonton hoped the same would happen up there, but, you know, just for a variety of different reasons, it, it just never came to fruition. We'll see if McClellan does that with the Kings here. Uh, with some of those younger forwards that he has. And we'll talk plenty of NHL over the course of the season here with Brian, but I do want to spend a couple of minutes on this because it's right in your backyard. The Shriners Hospitals for Children Open, TPC Summerlin, this week's PGA Tour event, really good field here as a lot of guys get ready for the Asian swing. Kepka, Cantlay, Deshambo, Scott, Simpson, Finau, Matsuyama, Woodland, Morikawa, Neiman, Snedeker, Benny On. Cameron Champ, who played very well last week and picked up the win. A lot of talent here at TPC Summerlin this week. More, yeah, it's gotten better, and it's it's clearly a function of uh, the FedEx Cup points now, you know, wrapping around into next year. The one thing that I think, I mean, the, the calendar part of the year, you know, doesn't help. Uh, but come on, man, it's still Vegas. And I I think why... And, again, like the guys you mentioned, Kepka can't lead the Shambo, Matsuyama, Scott. Okay, nice, really good players. I mean, Kepka's awesome, obviously. But I think a lot of the best players in the world don't come here because it's a putting tournament. And it infuriates me, Adam, that this course, if they grow the rough an inch or two and put the pins in gnarly spots, okay, you got a golf tournament. I mean, the winning score around here is always 25 under par. There's nothing exciting about a birdie. It's expected. So I think the best players in the world say, man, anybody can win that thing. And and they don't come. Now, the only thing, and we're waiting to see right now, it's a gorgeous morning, but at this time of year, the great equalizer and the only defense mechanism the course has is wind, and it can't howl here. So then it's one of these things to see, is the wind all day? Does the wind pick up in the afternoon? So then tee times become a big deal. So as you're thinking about that, and, and I don't know if the tee times are out all, or you know, across the field yet, but just in general, are, are there some price plays that you're looking at here this week? Yeah, I, I listen. I I don't think uh, you know Kepka. Honestly, eight to one. You know, I get it, but I just think that this it, it, everybody is right there in this tournament because it's not it's not a brutal course. Not the way they set it up, anyway. So yeah, I, I would. I, I can't. I got to keep going with them. Dylan Fratelli is so close. Adam had him last week. He had the lead after the first round. This is two weeks in a row. He shoots sixty six on Sunday. Saturday, I, I don't know what the heck happened to him. He disappeared, and then he comes back with the best round on Sunday. This guy uh, is a. He can get hot, and in this course, you know, you got to be firing sixty fours. Uh, and and he's that kind of guy, so I'll stick with him. Uh, I think Andrew Putnam had a play on him over uh, 
uh, across the pond two weeks ago. And he actually played very well over there in the, uh, what was it, the uh, BMW? He played well. Uh, I think Andrew Putnam uh, coming out of that event uh, at 65 to 1, 60 to 1, 71 is, is a guy I could take a look at. And then I think there are numerous, play, you know, bombs that you can go up. But this, this is the kind of guy, uh, tournament, I'm telling you, like, can't you, can you see the headline? And he's capable of winning now, too. I mean, Jonathan Vegas at 125 to 1. Vegas wins Vegas, blah, blah, blah. See the headlines now. He can win this tournament. And by the way, Nick Watney, uh, you know, works with Butch Harmon here in Vegas. All right? So there's, there's Vegas ties. And a lot of us, Kevin Na, Ryan Moore, Vegas guys have fared well in this tournament. Nick Watney just finished 10th in the Safeway. I think Nick Watney coming in here at 110 to 1 is a ridiculous price. Some good looks there to be sure from Brian Blessing, the host of Sportsbook Radio and Vegas Hockey Hotline. Brian, how can people check out those two shows of yours? All right, Adam, I appreciate that. Uh, KSHP.com, I put them out on Twitter at Brian Blessing. Uh, Noon to 2 Pacific time, uh, Sportsbook Radio, both sides of the counter, got you covered with sportsbook directors and handicappers. And then Vegas Hockey Hotline, here we go. It's the start of an NHL season. Um, Golden Knights owner Bill Foley, I'm waiting to find out this morning if he's coming in the studio uh, tomorrow or Thursday. Um, But we get great guests from around the hockey world. And it's it's so funny, Adam. I don't know. Do you have days like when you do the you know when you do the podcast? Like it just flies by, right? And, and you know, and when it flies by, I think it was better or it was good or or but it's, it's when it drags, you know, you know something wasn't right. There. This stupid hockey show, it, you know, in the summer in August, you know, talking hockey, it's the fastest hour of my day. This sport is so awesome that you know you can talk about it, and there's a lot of information. Uh, with a level of passion and fun, I you know I, I love the hockey show. If you're a hockey fan, I think you'll really enjoy it. We get great guests. Yeah, you most definitely do. And and make sure you check out over on our Bang the Book YouTube channel. Brian will have some free pick videos and some NHL thoughts for us here this week as well. So it should be a whole lot of fun to check that out. And of course, as he mentioned on Twitter at Brian Blessing. Brian, as always, a pleasure, man. Thank you so much for joining me. We'll talk to you again next week. Adam, it's always a pleasure, buddy. Have a good day.